Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Kave for that lovely uh, piece right there. And then I also wanted to thank our other band, Ms. Me, for being here today. Thank you so much for coming out to our second annual Rusticator Picnic. If you guys want to come on in and have a seat, we have a treat for us here today. We have a vintage wedding fashion show that we're very excited to be able to present today. So um, there's a lot of people standing in the back and encourage you to come have a seat with us. Uh, my name is Rainy Bench and I'm the executive director here at the Seal Cove Auto Museum. And uh, I'm so happy to have you all with us here today. As I said, this is our second annual Rusticator Picnic, so we are um, working on bringing people here to the ground to the Seal Cove Auto Museum more, and so we're doing more events like these to be able to welcome people to this beautiful location and see this collection. I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this event today. They are listed um, up front and on your baskets. Uh, there are so many sponsors who came out in support of this event, so I'm um, not going to have a chance to list them all here, but please um, make note of that and we really appreciate their support and help for this event to make it possible. We also have a lot of volunteers who have been so fantastic in helping to coordinate this um, and bring it all together for us to be here today, so I want to thank them as well. The Seal Cove Auto Museum is very excited to be growing in the ways that we are. We are becoming more involved in our community here. We are partnering with other organizations like Woodlawn and Ellsworth, the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. We have work that we're doing with um, camps, Camp Beach Cliff, the Southwest Harbor Library Camp. We also have um, admissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, programs that we're doing with other museums, including the Alice Head Museum uh, down in Rockland. So we're getting out more and more, we're welcoming people to our site more, and we're becoming much more engaged with this community. And it's very exciting for us to be able to um, be part of this uh, and to watch this grow. And it takes a really amazing team of people to be able to do that. So I don't want to go too much on about that. Uh, we have this really fantastic fashion show planned for us today. We had one, one last raffle ticket, so if you haven't had a chance to buy your raffle tickets uh, in the mixed in with the fashion show today, I'm going to be drawing, actually Sherry here, Allie, is going to be drawing the winners for our raffles. So um, thank you for coming out and supporting that. So this fashion show is presented, um, it's a vintage bridal show, so we'll have um, some different sets of outfits that we'll be seeing that all date from the late 1800s to the early 1920s, 1930s. And these are garments from the private collection of Norma Sperling. If you've been to the museum before, last year we had a collection of her outfits on exhibit as part of the Rusticator picnic, and this year we we're fortunate to have a few more pieces as well. But we decided to liven things up a little bit and do a live show. So I wanted to welcome you to the Seal Cove Auto Museum Vintage Bridal Show. We are here today uh, to see the garments modeled that date back from 1897 is our earliest piece and continue up through the 1920s and 30s. All the vintage garments that are worn here today come from Norma's private collection. She's been collecting vintage clothing for over 30 years. So we're excited to be able to begin. And I'm going to sort of set the stage for you here. If we can picture the early 1900s, the month of August as today, a beautiful time here on Mount Desert Island. We all know the sun is shining, the breeze is blowing, it's not too hot, thankfully. Many summer romances are in the air. The, following the proper code of etiquette at the time, it was once appropriate um, that when you found a mate and the engagement was solidified, the next order of business was to choose the trousseau, which would include personal as well as household linens in quantities that would lap as lavish as the family's wealth would permit. A modest trousseau might include three dozen of everything, and that was usually monogra uh, monogrammed. Excuse me. A basket would also be included, which would contain, a, if um, appropriate, about the equivalent of a year's salary, which would include gifts such as lace, fans, jewelry, furs, trinkets, and candy boxes. However, today, gathered together, are the bride's friends, and they're gathering at a local boarding house for the bridal shower. The idea originated in the late 1800s to strengthen friendships between the bride and her friends. The theme is intimate apparel, which will give the bride a chance to enlarge her trousseau. So, our first model. Here we go. Kathleen is here wearing a cotton corset cover. 
This has a rounded yoke and a button-down bodice. There is a defined waist and a very beautiful hemline. This is a necessity for every well-bred girl. So underneath this, she would have also been wearing a corset, but Kathleen is not wearing a corset today. We can get a sense for the cover. Thank God, she says. <laughs> if you walk around a little more. Yes. panel of fine pleats and lace at the front, and the buttons, which descend from the rounded neckline. The wispy split sleeves display several layers of lace. The garment ties in the back. It's important to keep her head warm and retain her body heat during her slumber time, so she wears a frilly cotton nightcap. <laughs> Moving into the 1920s, we see more sensual garments start to become popular. Lovelier fabric, fabrics such as silks and satin, as shown here with what she is wearing. She has an envelope chemise, which combines the chemise and drawers with a button closure. As common during this era, there is a lack of a bust line. The spaghetti straps and the small lace panel enhances the bodice area. And last in our um, intimate apparel, we see the perfect nightgown for the wedding night. Here's Lisa wearing a creamy satin gown with a deep plunge down the lacy bodice. This is it's neatly tied with a creative bow. A wide panel drops from the bodice to the floor while the garment is secured at the waist with a satin ribbon. So now we're going to look at the wedding itself. We've uh, been able to see some of the, uh, what the bride might enjoy ahead of the wedding, but now we're going to imagine ourselves at the church, and we're waiting in anticipation for the bride to walk down the aisle. The magic moment has finally arrived after weeks of preparation. But first, here comes the bride's name. This gown was worn by Ella. And it was actually a bridesmaid gown worn in 1898. This garment is made entirely of accru lace, and it has a shawl collar, three quarter sleeves, with a small band of satin encircling them. A satin cummerbund accents the gown, which has a back foot closure. Her head is adorned with her best hat from home. The deep mauve chapeau with folding back is made of velvet and lace. Orange marabou feathers decorate the wide brim and crown. She carries an arrangement of beautiful flowers. Thank you. And now we have our first bride. She is accompanied by Tommy Alley, escort for this uh, event, this momentous occasion. Beth is wearing an 1890s satin white gown with balloon sleeves and the pretty sweetheart neckline above a puckered bodice. The angle length is made of netting with a wide band of encircling satin. A panel of gauze is trimmed with satin over, uh, which overlies the hips. Note the large satin bow in the waistline. She wears her grandmother's bridal headpiece and carries her own Bible. Thank Our next bride is Kathleen, wait for her escort to join her, and she will be modeling a mid-length wedding dress from 1924. 
It's made of champagne satin with a rounded neckline and short sleeves. The dropped waistline and hips is accentuated with piping from which lovely lacing is draped over the satin to the scalloped waistline. Note the cape flowing from the neckline. She also wears a halo with a cascade of netting. Her bridal, bridal bouquet is very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> So this had to suffice. As in many garments of the 1930s, the emphasis is on the back, where we see a long slit with a book closure. This multi-gore skirt flows nicely down over the hip line, revealing the shape of the buttocks. In lieu of a veil, <laughs> silver beads and a mother of pearl insert on the front. The perfect accessory includes her blue Merlebor jewelry. <laughs> so after the wedding, of course, every couple wants to go on a honeymoon. This is um, covered at great length by the different manners and customs of the time, and the sole purpose is to ensure a couple's privacy. It's recommended that the newlyweds traveling with trunks containing everything necessary to create a charming environment for themselves wherever they might go. So many newly cu married couples love the warm weather for romance and starting off their new lives of adventure together. As this is August, we can use our imagination and place the scene of these next uh, outfits maybe at Old Orchard Beach or here on Mount Desert Island. So our first um, uh, outfit that we're going to be looking at uh, is how can you go to the beach or to some place warm without bringing a bathing attire and going for a dip in the lake or the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so we're going to go wearing a black cotton one-piece swimming dress. It has a button-down front and a midi collar decorated with white stripes and a tie. White machine stitching accents the garment. And as in accordance with the early 1920s, black tights are a must, and it's improper to show her legs. She wears a cute matching bonnet and carries a parasol too to ward off the strong summer rays. with the era. She complements her attire with a gorgeous champagne colored hat with a deep crown and wide brim. Her accessories include a matching boa, a rope necklace, or two pads, shoes, and a beautiful ivory iridescent beaded purse. The attire is lovely enough to wear to a tea or on a garden tour. Worn on a Panama Canal cruise in the 1930s. 
She dons a velvet cape from which only one sleeve is present, which makes this a very curious garment. The sleeveless slinky down with a bodice sporting golden beads arranged in a geometric design is of a lighter salmon hue. The fabric flows sleekly over the bodice and hips. The low back is typical of the 1930s evening gown. Her accessories include a velvet bag, uh, excuse me, a matching velvet beret decorated with sequins, an ivory satin evening purse with embroidered pink flowers, and her gloves, of course. <laughs> Our next model, Lisa, has this youthful canary yellow gown of the 1930s. It gives a hint of South America. The short sleeve bolero jacket covers the spaghetti straps and collar. From the underlying bodice, and mul a multitude of ruffles cascade down the hipline. Her white opera gloves are perfect with the attire. She brought her few necessities in a tiny beaded purse. Can't you just envision her dancing the tango on the border of Summer's Eve? <laughs> So we have um, one more selection from our um, attire of Norma, and this is the surprise. There have been many surprises that have come from a fun-filled honeymoon. And here's Kathleen. <laughs> We also have 
had helpers in the back. We had uh, Sandy Snow helping to dress. Uh, we had Diana Novella helping to dress as well, and uh, Marsha McFarland. So we appreciate their help to make this fashion show such a great success.